Yes, what an epic like trailer, right? Um, you get that, and then you get me. That cuts to me. Like it's like, I thought we were gonna watch a movie or do something awesome, and now I gotta listen to this guy talk. Oh, that's gonna be great. Um, I'm Kevin Rush, and um, I um, am kind of the guy um, that you kind of vaguely remember. Every time I'm here, you're like, I kind of remember this guy a little bit. I kind of recognize his face, but I don't remember his name. It's normal. It's okay, because um, I haven't been here a while. Like in 2010, I actually stepped out. I left um, New Hope Ashland at that time. Actually, I was a part of all the campuses, but stepped out to, to prepare to start to plan a church in Cleveland. And uh, in 2011, through support of you and other amazing churches like you, we started City Edge, and it was, it's been an amazing ride and experience. But just recently, um, God was doing something in our church and in me uh, and my wife and my family, and uh, it's been really amazing of how he's met us and, and healed us and done different things in our lives. But it just became really clear that God was calling us to end City Edge, to celebrate it, and to move on. And so it was like a real shock to us, because in a lot of ways we thought we were going to be doing this for a really long time. And even up until like that week, then we were challenged, our church, are like, are we going to continue or are we going to, to not? I have a bassy voice. Um, or indigestion, one of the two, I'm not sure. Um, but so we ended up in celebrating it and, and, and moving on. And we just wanted you to know, like, people, like, whenever they hear that, they're like, oh. So their first thought was like, you know, sentimental and sad for us, but we're good. And the other thing is like, are you okay? Are you going to make it? You're going to make it? Are the kids going to eat? Uh, and uh, yeah, God's been super good to us and laid other opportunities before us and is providing for us. But we'd love for you to pray for uh, me and my wife. My wife's right here, my beautiful smoking hot and holy wife right there. Um, and so we'd love you to pray for us and our, our, our uh, three girls as we just transition on to whatever's next. And, uh, you know, if you want to reach out, we'd love to share stories. God's done so much in us uh, and our kids. Um, but just know we're doing well. We're not discouraged. Um, and we, we love Jesus. We love his church. And we love the mission of what God's uh, doing in the world more than ever. And a lot of it is through this journey, we've been shaped in our identity in Christ. And today, that's kind of what I'm, I'm here uh, to talk to you uh, about. Now, when Rob asked me to come speak for this series, he kind of said, here's the, ch here's the verse and the chapter, and, and here's the general direction I want. But you can literally, uh, during this series called Blockbuster and the Bible, you're in week two, he said, you can pick any movie you want to talk about. You can do this in any way you want to talk about. Um, you can do multiple movies, whatever, whatever comes to your mind. And of all the movies in all the worlds, the hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of movies, um, I pick this movie. And instead of you showing you the, the regular trailer of this movie, I decided to show you guys the Honest trailer. Anybody seen like Honest trailers on YouTube clips? Anybody? Raise of hands, like three of you. Awesome, all the kids are excited, they're like, yes. Um, and so, th so these trailers, instead of like giving you like, this is going to be awesome, they just kind of straight tell you uh, what the movie is like. And so uh, we're gonna watch that trailer and we're gonna get started. Universal Pictures proudly presents the film you realized had absolutely no dialogue whatsoever. Only after you bought your ticket. Les Miserables, please. Told in award-winning songs of beauty and exuberance. Except those sung by Russell Crowe. Unless you learn the meaning of the law, I have made a false report. We may have met. Characters often singing about things that could be very easily done by just talking normally. Seriously, they sing everything. So to hit that point even harder, we thought we'd sing the rest of the trailer. Meet the spirit of human redemption, John Valjean. A parole thief now in the one another assumed identity for reasons never made clear in the entire movie. Must face off against Inspector Javert, an officer with such terrible priorities. Set up the entire city of Paris on lockdown to stop a man who already served his time. Follow along in their epic game of cat and mouse that spans 20 years, which is almost as long as the movie feels. <laughs> Starring. you after sitting through this movie, then you should really rethink your relationship. 
<laughs> I love that. Isn't that awesome? Um, now, because I, like all night Rob was last night trying to get me to say, because he's Canadian, right? So he's half French. Isn't that how it is? Um, <laughs> and he's saying it's like he's trying to get me to say, uh, you know, it's like I can't say it. And he's just all night trying to help me pronounce it. I'm like, I can't pronounce it, all right? I just move on. I am way too... Americanized and uh, do not have any sophistication at all. Uh, I can barely speak English, so let's not try to teach me French. Um, so I'm just going to do my best to say Les Mis um, throughout uh, the day, but if I say Les Mis, it's forgive me, that's the best French I got. Um, uh, so um, all, all joking aside, uh, in a series called The Blockbuster and the Bible, I cannot think of a better movie to pick, a better narrative, a better story to pick than uh, Les Mis. It, it's, it's this this story, most of us just are used to the, the playwright, you know, what we see, this is based off the, you know, the, the play. Um, I hear like Loudonville just recently did this or something in the schools, which is awesome. Um, and, uh, but it really comes from this old book, like this really old uh, book written in 1862 by Victor Hugo, who wrote The Notre Dame and what, uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame and some other, other books like this. And what's really interesting about his writings is he wrote really, really, really big books with lots of commentary on like social society of human condition and life um, and even faith. Um, Les Mis is literally a book that is a four volume book of many of people who are, are struggling in life and society. And it is 2,000. 800 pages long. Just to give you perspective, the Bibles that are here are 800 pages. Um, and so now you know why it's called the miserables, right? Less miserables. Uh, les miserables. It is, when you read it, you would be like, I'm, I'm never reading this book. I'm never going to make it to the end. Um, and so you've, you've, you've probably guessed by now, I, I just kind of til tilted my hand, that les mis, les miserables, means what? The miserables, the wretched, the outcasts, those far um, in society, outside of society, the, the people who are the least of the least, the broken, the destitute. That is what Les Mis is about. And whether you're a Christian or not, um, I think that when we think about the Bible, we've picked up some strange things about it, right? We've picked up some strange things about what it is and what it isn't. See, some people think the Bible is this rule book. Of if I just lived up to the rules, if I did enough good stuff, if I did what it said in there, if I, I lived by these laws, you know, um, then God would accept me. Then I would get in to his presence for both now and for eternity. You know, good, good things would come my way. And although the Bible is a book of telling us, you know, um, of how life works best, it has some rules in there that point to how life works best, that isn't really the point of the Bible. Now, other well-meaning Christians might tell you that it's a, you know, it's an acronym or synonym or whatever. Again, not good with English. Um, but the literary device where you take the first letter, right? Bible. Basic instructions before leaving Earth as if we're some alien race that's trying to get out of here. <laughs> right? I mean, this is, this is uh, I, I think, again, well-meaning, but I don't think that's the point of the scriptures either. And probably the most like silly one, the most ridiculous one when I think about it is that I've heard people say is that the Bible is a book of heroes to emulate. Really? Have you read it? Like these guys are really messed up. Like, I mean, they do some really wicked, weird stuff. And even the ones that like God clearly comes to and they do some of the stuff that God asks, there's many times that they're just very defiant. They do their own thing. They go their own way. A and these are the people that we think of, really? These are the people God picks to use? Um, see, if, if I was going to tell you what, what the Bible is, and since I'm preaching, you have to find out, is what I believe the Bible is, it's not just good people to emulate. Actually, most of these people are wretched and miserable. They're the outcasts. They're these silly people. They're, they're these defiant people. I think a better description of what the Bible is, is a library of true stories of what a beautiful and just God has done to change to heal, and yes, even use wretched, broken people. And I believe that God wants to do that again with you, which each one of you, each man and woman, uh, young man, young woman who is in this room, that God wants to do that again, to take this wretched group of people, this broken, 
and, and destitute kind of people, the outsiders, the outcasts, and tell them who they are in him and him alone. Um, so today we're going to look at two wretches, one from the Bible and one from Les Mis. And first we're going to start, um, we're going to look at John Valjean from Les Mis, but first we're going to start with Paul from the Bible. And if you've got a Bible, go ahead and get it out. We'll be in Acts 9, uh, chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, punch somebody next to you and take it. They have to forgive you. They're a Christian. So that's how it works. Um, so take it. You can get out your phone if you have a phone. Acts 9, 1. We're going to be there in just a second. Now, when we think of Paul, some of us may remember Paul a little bit. Like, yeah, wasn't he like one of the early church people, whether you grew up in like a Catholic faith or remember going to church a little bit and hearing about this Paul guy? Um, you hear about Paul and you go, um, Paul, yeah, he was like one of the early leaders of the church, right? He was one of the people that led the church to help. Uh, he wrote a lot of the New Testament, you know, the new, newer part after Jesus about how the church should, should interact and care about the world. And, uh, and Paul, man, he, he was like this hero in the faith. He was the one who spread the faith around. He went from like city to city and started churches and all this stuff. He's like, he's a hero. Uh, but before he was leading the church, uh, he was actually Jewish and he has a different backstory. And isn't that interesting how so many of us say we actually have a different backstory? See, before he went by the name Paul all the time, he went by this name Saul. And Saul, uh, if we pick up where that, that's where we're going to pick up today, he has a very different story. So let's dive in. Uh, chapter 9 of Acts, verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering breaths, or was uttering threats with every breath that he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest and he requested letters addressed to the synagogue in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the rest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, or he wanted to bring them, both men and women, he doesn't discriminate, <laughs> back to Jerusalem in chains. See, the first leader of the church was a murderous, uh, <laughs> if you really go to the backstory, he was a murderous, imprisoning kind of dictator ruler of, of what he thought God was all about. See, he was from the Jewish people, and the Jewish people believed that this Messiah was going to come and was going to put them on top. Finally, we're not going to be the out, we're not going to be the ones on the fringe. We're finally going to be put back in power. See, at this time, Rome was in power, and, and, and even though Saul was very well thought of in both the Rome and Jewish, he just was waiting to be back on top. And here comes these followers of Jesus that says, no, it's not just you guys who are back, who God wants to put in right standing and to free and to give hope to. He wants to give all people. And so Saul, being the best of the best, he was literally the best of the best Jew person there ever was. Like he lived by all the rules. He, he did whatever he could. He, he literally was trained in this school of Gamiel. And Gamiel would be like the, the Yale, of the, if he was going to the school of Gamiel, uh, it would be like the Yale of, of education, right? And not only the, this would he be going to the Yale of education, he would be going to learn from the president, the most tenured, the most uh, brilliant scholar uh, in Gamiel. He was like the brilliant guy, right? And so he was directly trained. He was the best of the best. He had it together. He knew what was right and knew what was wrong. And he was even in this, we think of him as this evil, murderous person, but he was doing what was right in his eyes, by what he thought God was saying throughout the Old Testament, that our people will be back on, on, on top. And so he, as he's, you know, going after these people, he wants to bind them. He goes literally to the high priest and says, look, give me a list. I want a roll call of everybody in that synagogue and so I can find out who is followers of the way so I can imprison them and bring them back so we can stomp out this falsity that there, was a, there is a Jesus and a Jesus who wants to, to save all people and give all people hope. That's not what, what the scriptures say. The scripture says that we are on top. And into this, the story uh, continues. On his way to Damascus, it says this. As he was approaching Damascus on his mission to imprison and to murder people, <laughs> a light from heaven suddenly shone around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Isn't it interesting that when this best of the best is called by name and is, is, is confronted with true power, he immediately said, like, who are you, Lord? Like, who is this one who's really in charge? I've seen something different than I've ever seen before. It goes on and says this, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one who you are persecuting. Now get up and go to the city, and you will be told 
what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, as you do when a voice is heard, from, for they had heard the, the, the sound of someone's voice, but Saul, no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind, and so his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat nor drink. Um, I, had a fr- I have a friend named Jason Lance, and Jason's a, just a good friend of mine, and he was telling me, or he was telling the story the other day. Um, he said, like, uh, it was at the beginning of, of the end of the winter coming into the spring season, right? And when you go outside, you look at your yard, and you go, like, what happened here, right? The bushes are overgrown. Plants are eating other plants for some reason. And uh, he just said, like, man, I better cut the shrubs before the, the neighbors think that we've, like, are AWOL, right? And so he's, like, he gets out um, his, his, his shrub cutter, and he gets extension cords out and starts you know, plug them in, plug them in, gets over, gets the, the ladder out, goes around the house to the big bush in the back, and here's this big bush, right, in the back of the, the yard. So he climbs up on the ladder and starts going at it, and he said, you know, I, I have a tendency to, you know, daydream and zone off. So here I am daydreaming a little bit, and all of a sudden I hear, it, and guess what happened? He hits the cord. Now, he didn't cut it yet, but he got it caught. And so as he's getting the cord, he said he immediately goes, man, I got to need to get that out of there, he said in his brain. And he started to grab for it. And as soon as he started to grab for it, th- he said the other part of my brain said, wait a minute, that could kill you. And as he grabbed, uh, he, as he was going for the grab this, he wondered, man, I wonder which side of my brain won out. Minutes later, he woke up, <laughs> laid down flat on the ground, and realized which one it was, right? He said he got up and immediately jumped up and he started looking around. He's like, I wonder if my neighbors saw me. He's like, nope, I'm good. Like, and so he, he picked, his, picked himself back up and started to go about his day. Now, I imagine that that's what it was like for Saul, right? It was this encounter with the living God of so much power and so much might that it literally changed everything that he, uh, his reality was rocked. And he woke up in a whole new world like, whoa, did anybody see that? Did anybody see what's going on? And see, when we come into contact with the power of the living God, Everybody notices, don't, don't they? Like when you, we really come into a life-changing, you know, experience with God, people around you start to go, what's, what's that about? Why, is, why are you different? What's going on in your life? Because the power, even though, you know, we, I think we talk about God as if he's like this safe thing, but no, the power of God, he's, he's dangerous. He can literally rock our world, and we can wake up in a whole new reality. Now, when I read that conversion story of Saul, this murderer um, that encounters Christ and, and, and gives his life over to him, I, I, I don't know about you, but I go like, God, why don't you do that in my life, right? If you can do it then, why can't you do it now? Why don't you just show up and just level me, you know what I mean? Like, like knock me straight on my butt, you know, and, and, and show me what the true reality is like. But I think God knows our hearts, and I think he knows what he had to do to get through to Saul. But for us, sometimes we're just way too prideful, you know? I know it. I know the answers. I know enough to get by. I know um, what true power is, you know? I'm good enough. And we do it on our own. Or we think God's this safe thing that's just in an electric, you know, that's safe, covered by cable instead of an all-powerful God that can really not only end my life, but wreck my life, right, you know? Lay me out cold. Um, or maybe we're just ty- we're not we're afraid to be foolish to wake up and, and acknowledge how much power is really accessible to us, right? We're, we feel foolish that wow, I knew that power was in that cord, but I never grabbed it. Now I'm not saying that we should go around grabbing power cords or we should test God, but what if that we are opened ourselves up to experience the power of the living God? I bet if we did our reality, just like Paul, would be completely and utterly changed, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? See, I believe all good stories, um, fictional or true, um, only happen, are only worth reading when, s- when they come against something that's bigger than themselves, right? Any story you ever loved, it, it's been this story of, of, of getting through a conflict. And the great stories are not just the ones that there's some external conflict, but there's an internal conflict, right? They look at themselves and they see inner demons. They see things that they can't break in themselves, that they see that they're weak and frail and that they're in need. And yet somehow, through 
through uh, usually some kind of outside, digging deep or outside source of themselves that something breaks in, that something changed, that, that through community or through, through a power, they make it through. Right? See, these, these people, these outcasts, these wretched, these people that are honest, that they're miserable in their life, or the, it's, it's the moment when power can break into their life. And the same thing can happen to us if, if we open ourselves to the power of God's love and truth to just change us in an instant. And no matter what, what our struggle is, whether it's an inside, you know, demon or that we've been handed, you know, we've been dealt a deck of cards and we're trying to say, what do we do with this? This is our plight in life. What do we do with this? That God's powerful enough to break through and see us through no matter what. The other story uh, of, of of a wretch that we're going to check out, the, uh, another miserable person, is Jean Valjean um, in, this, in, in Les, Les Mis. And unlike Saul, who was the best of the best, right? I'm the best of the best. Uh, I, I, I'm, I've lived into all the laws. I've done everything right. I, I'm pure, you know, I'm good and all this other stuff. He finds himself in a very different story. Jean Valjean is a thief to survive. He's, he's learned how to survive by being a thief. He's learned to survive um, by the, ha the hand that he was dealt. Now he's an ex-convict. He's, he's got out of serving his time. And by necessity, he's trying to find how to live in society. And as each place that he goes, he's getting turned away. That is, his identity of him being a thief is following him wherever he goes because he's got parole papers that says, I'm a thief on this. And so wherever he goes, he says, like, look, we don't want your kind here. And they keep pushing him, pushing him further to the edge until he's like a dog just trying to survive, right? A dog that's been beaten. He's just trying to survive if you watch, watch the movie. And, and, and he's trying to make it through next. And he's found, we're going to watch a clip here, and he's found sleeping in a graveyard. And this bishop comes to him, the bishop of this, you know, kind of oversees the, the grounds, if you will. He takes him in to the church, grabs him, takes him in. He said, whatever, you know, you can, we have food. We can share whatever mine is yours. You know, you can come and stay. And so he has him stay the night. And in the middle of the night, Jean Valjean's still in this kind of dire, trying to just to survive, right? And the plight that he's, ho that he's been, been dealt. He decides, I'm going to steal as much silver as I can grab. And I'm going to get out here tonight. I'm going to grab this. And from this, I'm going to go, you know, continue on to try to survive. And in this clip, he's dragged back by authorities. Authorities capture him. And they drag him back and throw him before the bishop. And the bishop... And this is where we're going to pick up this scene and the bishop uh, confronting him. Get in there! Put him down! Stay there! Monsignor, we have your silver. We caught this man red-handed. Get the nurse to say you gave him this. That is right. But my friend, you left so early. Surely something slipped through my head. You forgot. I gave these also. Would you leave the best behind? Stay put. Monsieur, release him. This man has spoken truth. I commend you for your duty. Now God's blessing grow with you. But remember this, my brother. Feel the sun by your plan. You must use this precious silver to become an honest man. By the witness of the martyrs, by the passion and the blood, God has raised you out of darkness. I have saved your soul So Jean Valjean sits there at the feet of a guy who can totally condemn him. Has every right to condemn him, right? He stole from him. He's taken you know, things from him. And here he stands behind, before this bishop. And what does the bishop do? He gives him more. Not only here's what you took, but here's more. This here's even 
here's an unmerited favor upon unmerited favor. Here's grace upon grace upon grace. And John Valjean, if you watch the movie, he's a wreck, right? He's a complete wreck with this. Like, why did this guy who could, who could literally throw me back in prison, what I deserve, not only maybe back to prison, but maybe back to noose. Maybe my life is in his hands. And this guy, instead of condemning me, frees me. Gives me a, and not only does he free me, he gives me a new life. He says, take this silver and take this silver and start a new life, that your life has been bought by God. An encounter of grace by that magnitude, right, demands a response of some sort. And I believe uh, that kind of, kind of unmerited favor, of extravagant unmerited favor, there's only really two ways um, that we can respond to that. And both of them still point up how, how miserable we are, how wretched we are. The first, if you were in John Valjean's, you know, shoes or on his knees begging before, you know, the bishop. The first, and as he gives you all this stuff, would be, what a fool, right? What a fool. Why would you give somebody that? Which shows really how, how despicable and wretched and how miserable your heart really is, right? And then the other thing, when you come in, in contact with that much grace is to say, what a wretch am I that you still free me with enough grace. The response is overwhelming to say, wow, look how much that you are generous and loving and graceful, even in spite of my heart. See, all through the movie, um, he's, been, he's able to justify his action. Well, I stole bread because I had to feed my family. I, I did this to, to do that, you know? I have to steal from you because nobody let me work. And he's right, right? There's some justification to that that's true. But there's something deeper that is still what a wretch am I. And in that moment, he is overwhelmed by God's grace, and he literally gives his life, life to the Lord. He, he confesses that he needs God and, and, and thanks him for this new chance to start over, um, to humble himself, to, to live a new life of, of what the bishop gave him, to take that silver and start a new life. And from that, he became this business owner. You follow the movie, becomes this business owner. He does. He gives his life to serving others. Really, he he, he hires those who are, who are on the edges, the ones that that are pushed out in the margin. He said, like, look, I'll hire you. Like, come work at my factory. I want to give you a chance. And he does all this he can. He actually uh, builds up such a rapport of serving others and loving the community uh, that he becomes the the mayor, Le Mieux, French for the mayor, <laughs> right? <laughs> Le Mieux, uh, whatever. Uh, he becomes. I sound like a lamb or something. Anyhow, he becomes the mayor. And I, I would love to say, and he lived happily ever after, right? End of the book. Let's shut it. But we all know, just like in this story, in our lives, just because we follow Jesus doesn't mean it's happily ever after, right? We gave our life to Jesus. We, we experienced his unmerited favor and received his grace for now and for eternity. But yet, it, the story doesn't end there, does it? Our past, our old identity of who we were, tends to follow us. It tries to ca catch up to us. It tries to say, no, you're not who, who God says you are. You're not beloved. You're not a treasure that he's willing to pay for, Over, you know, silver upon silver, merit upon merit. You're this wretched sinner. And so we try to distance ourselves from it. We try to cover it over. We try to let nobody know it. Um, but... And instead of pushing it away, we need to embrace it, that we are a wretch, that we are a sinner saved by grace. And this is what both Saul and Jean Valjean show us. See, Saul, he, wrote, he writes this in Romans when he's talking to, to, the, to the church. He wrote this as just a something for us to remember. It says, I have discovered this principle in life. He writes this in Romans 7, 21. I've discovered this principle in life, that, that when I want to do when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Anybody can, can relate to that? Yep. We want to do what's right. I mean, I wish I was that selfless person. I wish I would do that thing. I wish I would sacrifice for, for that person. I wish I could be my, the most heroic self that I could be, but we're not. And he goes on to say, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And he remembers, wait a minute. Who freed me in the first place? Thank God the answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right? 
See, Christ is the only thing that can, can change us, that can free us, that can empower us to become who God created us to be, to not live in our old fallen self, our old self that is just striving to grab things, to, to give ourselves an identity, but to look to him as a, as a son, as a daughter, as a person made in the image of God. It's him and only him that we do that. And we don't ignore the past. We embrace it and say, that's who we are. See, John Valjean, his past, old self, tries to catch up with him. And what he finds is, they have somebody, because he's been skipping parole, he just kind of took on a new name and a new life, he lived into his new self, his old self was starting to catch up with him because uh, they caught a guy and they said, oh, you're Jean Valjean, we're going to make you suffer. You know, we're, you're going to jail for skipping your parole all these years. And so he, he's confronted with, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm Jean Valjean, I know it. You know what I mean? This guy does not, should I let this guy take my sentence? Should I let him... Do what I have, and if I do, what's nice is that old self is dead, right? And he's conflicted. Do I let my old self die with that guy so I can sweep it under the rug and, and act like I'm only this guy? Or do I embrace my wrongdoings of who I was to deal with that? Does that make sense? Is he going to really say, that's who I am, but it's not, if that's who I was, but it's not who I am? And, and to not let this guy go, go to the noose for him, not to pay the price for him. And here, here we see in this scene, Jean Valjean is wrestling in private, praying and asking God what he should do. So check this out. Who am I? Can I condemn this man to slavery? Pretend I do not feel his agony. This innocent who bears my face, who goes to judgment in my place. Who am I? Can I conceal myself forevermore? Pretend I'm not the man I was before. I must my name until I die. Be no more than an alibi. Must I lie? How can I ever face my fellow men? How can I ever face myself again? My soul belongs to God. I made that bond long ago. He gave me hope when hope was gone. He gave me strength to journey on. Who am I? Who am I? Who are we? That's the question, right? Are, are we sinners saved by grace? Or, or are we looking for a quick fix to see, sweep it under the rug? Do we look at Jesus as an opportunity to sweep it under the rug? Or do we say we are a sinner saved by grace and it's in him that we are free to live into our new life, to who we are created to be? So we are willing to confess our sins because it only brings him more glory and only creates us in more in his image, in our weakness that we are made strong, not in our strength. It's great that you have strengths. God created you with them. He wants you to use them. But how much more, the only way he can change you is if you give him his weak, your weaknesses, which is where you need to be changed. It's your greatest need. In Christ, God shows us our true identity and our true destiny with him, both now and forever. It's not a thing about sweeping it under the rug. It's about God entering into our misery and our struggle and our brokenness and creating us into his image. And it's a powerful, beautiful thing. Um, in James, it says this, James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Oh, that's good. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. When was the last time that you confessed with brothers and sisters? That you were, you believed in grace enough that you could say like, here is where I'm struggling. This is what God has done in my life. This is what, I'm struggling with porn, I'm struggling with addiction, I'm struggling with uh, lust, I'm struggling with uh, loving my neighbor. I'm sorry, I'm giving this guy patience and grace. I'm struggling. It's not their fault. It's mine. It's, it's in those moments that we are healed. It goes on to say, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces what? 
Wonderful results. Wonderful results. Who wants to be healed? Who wants to experience powerful results? See, prayer is not just some throwing up some, some from, you know, softballs up to the sky gods to try to hit him out of the park. It, it's about connecting with him. It's about going to him to confess. And, and not only that, we're, we're called to, as the church to be able to confess to one another. Then we will be healed. See, there's something beautiful and powerful about the church being the bride, the person who literally gets to offer that grace to one another. Even in our misery, even in our, our brokenness, even in our need, moment of need, that we can be grace agents, people that offer love because we have humbled ourselves first and experienced that love. See, confession and prayer heals us from our sin and frees us from our false identity. Satan's always, the adversary is always trying to tell you who you were. He doesn't want you to be who God created you to be. He always wants to tell you who you were. That's his only game plan. And what's beautiful is he gives us as brothers and sisters to be able to be the people that call us into our true identity. Remember the first um, scene where the bishop has a chance to condemn him? Instead, he frees him. Um, in, in his like little motif, his song there, he says, by the martyrs, by the, by the stories of the martyrs, by the and then he says, by the passion of the blood. Um, and it's taken, that, that, that's got to be taken from 11, Revelation 12, 11. It says this, and they defeated, the, the followers of Jesus, the saints in heaven have defeated him, which is the adversary, by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their life so much that they were afraid to die. Right? They defeated him. They defeated the adversary by sharing by taking people to the cross and say your identity is not in your past, it's in your future with the cross of who God says you are. You take your past to him, so he gives you a new identity. And we keep, as you come and confess, we point you to who God says that you're his son, you're his daughter, you're, you're created in his image, that you are worth it, you're a treasure, that he went to the ends of the earth and back to win back to him and to call them into their true self. We share our testimony of what God's done and call people to the cross, that's when, because we're not afraid of death. We're not afraid of it. We're not afraid to show that that was our old self, and it's a decaying dead self, and here's our new self that lives on into eternity forever as we trust him. See, every time we share our story of what Jesus has done in our lives, we silence the adversary. Every time we share our story of what he's done and what he's doing, we silence that. He has nothing to say. He's like, dang it, that was my only go-to. That's my go-to move. And when we're willing to say, I'm a wretch, I'm a sinner saved by grace, it transforms, it empower, God's grace empowers us. The Spirit empowers us to become the people that we are meant to be, free from our sin. Now, too often, especially in the church, we should be the safest place in the world to confess our sins, but I feel like we're way too busy about condemning other things, right? You know, about other people and their problems. Well, all the LGBT community, they're just ruining the world, and our country's going to hell in a handbasket, and all this other stuff. And so we post things like, oh, we should humble ourselves and pray, and so our nation will be healed. Yeah, we humble ourselves and pray. We say we are sinners saved by grace. That It's in our humility. It's us laying ourselves down to say it's we're sinners saved by grace. That that, that kind of overwhelming sense of grace calls people, beckons people back to the love of Jesus. We don't sit there and pray for them. We don't get together and pray for the people who are far from God. We don't pray for the people. I mean, we pray for them, but we don't pray their sins. We pray that God, that they experience God's love. We want the best for them. We pray that they're, they experience God's love and are shaped in our identity, not judgment and, and thrown on them, right? We start with ourselves, so we are humble that we need grace. And so instead of talking about other people and, and who they're dating and who they're sleeping with and all this stuff, we start with our hearts and start in here. Who are we, what are we struggling with to give to Christ? Who are we living into our false old self? And where do we need to be reborn? Because the power of God is accessible to us if we humble ourselves before him and experience, experience his love. At the end of us, the amazing Spider-Man, the recent reboot, anybody like that? Any fans? Round of applause? Double? Sorry, I know, a heavy moment until like, hey, let's clap. Um, Peter Parker walks into this classroom at the end of the movie, right? And his English teacher says this. He said, I had a professor once, or she says this. She said, I have a professor once who liked to tell his students that there were only 10 different plots in all of fiction. 
Well, I'm here to tell you he was wrong. There is only one. Who am I? Who am I? Who are you? Are you, are, are you, think, you think of yourself as like the best of the best? I got it together. I've done the rules. I go to church every Sunday. I punch the cards. You know, I'm doing everything I can. I've read the books, you know. I, I manage my sin well. I manage my brokenness well. I got this. Um, are you more like Paul or Saul just saying, like, I got this. I'm going to do it on my own strength. Or are you Jean Valjean? Are you, you know, like, well, I've been, I'm, 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 you know, justifying everything. Well, I did that, you know, because I was hurt there. And it might be true, you know, all these things might be true. But are you just justifying yourself instead of owning it, that I'm a wretch? No matter who you are, either one, the good news is that God loves you beyond reason, that God's grace covers you, and not just covers you for eternity, that you get in the get out of jail free card, but that you get a new identity. And he begins to say, look, I've created you to be a beautiful gift to the world, to one another, and to the church, and that you can be healed. So stand with me. I'm going to pray for you. Um, God, you know our hearts. You know us inside and out. Um, and the adversary, he knows, he knows them too. And he's always gunning for us. He's always telling, trying to tell us who we were. So we get stuck in the false narratives of who we are. But when we confess to you and we confess to one another and we have a safe place where God's grace is just heaped upon um, one after another, that your love can break through and change us, that it's powerful enough, that your spirit empowers us to become who we were meant to be in you. And in our brokenness and in our humility, we come before you. And we ask you to, to make us new, to heal us, to mend us, to create us and to be the person we are. And so we can just boast more and more of the story of how you changed our lives, how you changed humanity, how you changed the course of countless lives and how you can change our lives today. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen.